Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, I don't know. <laughs> a little tired this morning, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, I've got just a few announcements for you, for everybody today. Uh, please remember to fill out the brown friendship folders at the end of the pews. Um, it helps you keep informed. It helps us inform you. And then... Um, also in the bulletin, you'll find the encouragement of the week. And then uh, community prayer will be at the First Christian Church on Tuesdays. And then um, if you're interested in praying before the service, uh, see Debbie Kelly for more information. And then finally, May 5th will be our annual elections. 
So uh, if you're a member, please come and vote. That's all I have. because it gives us a chance to, to get a little excited about being in church instead of like, uh, I'm in church this morning. How sad. Okay, but it's great to be here. So we'll just do it. We'll do it better than JR. How y'all doing this morning? We've been doing that for a long time because I want to make sure that everybody understands that God does amazing things in their lives, in your life. And sometimes we don't see it. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Not, not much, but just a little bit. That sometimes we don't see God working when he is at work every single day, every single moment in our life, guiding us, helping us, uh, helping us, encouraging us to continue down the path that he wants to go. I know he's cuter than I am. <laughs> He is so much cuter than I am, but that's okay. Uh, but God is going to be doing amazing things. We're going to have a great time celebrating this morning. This morning, I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about an important ministry within the Church of the Nazarene. We have a little video for you. I want to share that video with you, and then I want to kind of tell you a little bit about this ministry within the Church of the Nazarene. Hello, Frete. I am the pastor of the Church of the Nazarene in Laracunga, Ecuador. Since starting the WhatsApp ministry, I've found that it is a great tool. It has not only allowed me to disciple many people in my local church and in Ecuador, but the ministry has also reached people in Argentina, the United States, Peru, Venezuela, and Colombia. We are impacting many people in different countries. The WhatsApp ministry has really grown in number, and it has stretched me personally. The way I used to use WhatsApp was by sending messages like, how are you, or God bless you, or it was great to meet you. Now, it has grown to where I send devotionals once, twice, or three times a week. I also feel very blessed that two of the people in our church one is in the military and the other is a professor, have been sharing the devotionals with some of their peers. Because of those devotionals, new people have been coming to our church, all because people have been sharing the messages they receive. People are being impacted by the word of God. In another case, there is a district superintendent in Argentina who has been sharing the devotionals with the pastors on his district. Some of those pastors have sent me messages saying they are grateful to have received the word. People often think, I don't know what to write, or I don't know how to do it. I want to encourage you to use the instrument God has put in your hand and use it to send the message of salvation to those who need it. A few weeks ago, I was talking to the pastor at the First Methodist Church. His name is Reverend Zeze, and he was so excited. He's been talking to the ministry about a brand new opportunity that he is going to be uh, researching, and he's been talking to some people over in Africa about developing and getting a broadcast, a Christian broadcast, out to those areas of the world that it's very difficult to connect with. 
And, and I kind of I kind of snickered. And, he, and then the second time he talked about it, he said, I'd like all of us to get together for lunch or something because I'm really researching this and we need to have some funding. And I'm like, Zay Zay, um, we've been doing that since 1944. <laughs> In 1944, the Church of the Nazarene discovered that they could broadcast a Christian message throughout the week to all sorts of areas of the world that can't get it because it's very difficult to keep broadcast AM, F, AM radio, FM radio uh, broadcasts from getting into countries. You can't, you can't, unless you take down all the towers and eliminate all the broadcasts, you really can't stop it. And so the Church of the Nazarene has done this since 1944. I thought this was kind of interesting video because this, this gentleman, uh, this gentleman, discovered the WhatsApp, and he created the WhatsApp. And you go, how? so what, what's the app? I didn't, I, I just, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, this is a great video this week and everything. Never even put it together, try to download it this week or whatever. So what you do is you go to your phone's app store. It's either Google Apps or Apple Apps or Apple Store or the Google Store, whatever one you have. I know, what store is that? How do I get there? You drive down the street. <laughs> <laughs> at Lenzies, you turn right, <laughs> drive that for about 50 miles, okay? When you get into West Virginia and Maryland, you'll find the store. Okay, you just go to your, you go to your cell phone store and you just type in WhatsApp. And if it's, if they're, if they are supporting it, they will, you'll be, you'll be able to download. What's interesting about this app is that you can read a devotional in which all Nazarenes around the world are all, who have the same app are also reading the same devotional. And I think that's very significant because one of the things I like, I don't do it every, every day, and I know some of you depend on it every day, but we, I send out the verse of the day, and I can't believe how many people really do enjoy the verse of the day. I know some of you are like, yeah, okay, that's ding, up, oh, Pastor Raymond, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> and you move on, and that's fine, that's fine, okay. It's just that we, it, 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 when that app goes out, then that means our whole church, a lot of people are reading that verse at the same time, approximately the same time. And, and so we, you, what we want to do and what we're trying to do in the Church of the Nazarene is use technology where the Church of the Nazarene was at the cusp of technology through the radio and getting the message of Jesus out, out through the radio. We need to also be doing that with the technology of today instead of complaining about it. I like, I, I know, I know I can be classified as a senior adult, whatever. But I like when senior adults and some people complain about their cell phone. Man, the technology. Do you have a cell phone? Yeah, but I can't understand it. Well, what, <laughs> and you complain about something that you have. So instead of using it for bad, use it for good to sh share the message of Jesus. Uh, and if you, if you remember, if you think about your history, you know your little bit of history. In 1944, we launched this, wor at that time, it was World Evangelism Broadcast. I found out last year that in 2007, they changed it to World Mission Broadcast. <laughs> it only took me 20-some years to change over. <laughs> and uh, smile, okay? <laughs> <laughs> guys are just looking at me like, all right, whatever. And uh, get over it. I know we're going to be taking an offering. You already told us. Come on. <laughs> and so what we, um, uh, where was I going? Oh, 1944. If you know your history in 1944, what was occurring in 1944? World War II. So in the middle of World War II, the Church of the Nazarene started a ministry to broadcast throughout the world to get the message of Jesus Instead of being fearful that this was the end times, that this was what was going to happen in the future. Oh, how horrible. Instead of living in fear, they went ahead and, and did something that people nowadays are trying to, which is now even more expensive, trying to launch in other countries. So we're going to take a, a little bit of time here and take our... We're going to take a world evangelism broadcast. They suggest like $5 a person or whatever. You can put it with yes. The, we, you can write it out to the ch our church. We can Raymond D. Camillo. I'll just fill it in later. <laughs> Sorry.
<laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, shouldn't have. I, I just had all my mentors yelling at me because of that statement. <laughs> just make a, if you're writing out a check for this specifically, you can just make it out to the Monongahela Church of the Nazarene, and all the money that we gather for this ministry will go towards our world evangelism broadcast that is being supported. We're just asking for about $5 a person, and you, you have no idea how much that will help in sharing the gospel of Jesus. All right, some missions music.
morning as we go to prayer, we're going to, this is a time where we pray for the needs that we have, with presenting our, our problems, presenting prayers for other people. In our bulletin, you'll see that there are lists, there's a huge list of, of uh, people that we have put on our prayer list. And this is one thing that we'd like you to do is take the bulletin home each week pray for the people on that prayer list. Unfortunately, the prayer list has gotten a little too big, so we have to be able to do something about the prayer list. So the first thing we're going to do is if there's anybody that you've added that needs to come off the prayer list, please fill out next week. There will be a purple sheet in your bulletin. Fe please feel free to <laughs> have them removed. You know, we, we want to pray for people that have needs, and if that person has been healed. The second thing we're going to probably do is probably around June, we're going to purge the prayer list, and we'll just ask everybody to fill out another uh, another sheet for those who are on the prayer list. If, if this first step doesn't work, uh, it's not that we don't want to pray for people, but we want to pray for those that are in great need. Because you can pray for everybody in your family, and God will honor that, and we should be praying. And, and I understand that. So we're just needing to do something. And if the prayer list stays big, and that's fine, we'll probably just have to go and do another insert. We'll, we'll, we just, we're not sure if we want to go that route yet or not. Just want to let you know about that. So this morning, if you would like to pray this morning at the altar, you may come to this side of the altar. If you would just like to kneel and pray. And if you would like to be anointed by one of our staff members, uh, kneel over or you can sit on the front pew. But we're going to spend some time talking to God, asking him to meet some of our needs in our life. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to hear us. We know that you hear us. We ask you to heal many people in our lives. We ask you to be close to them, Lord. We ask you that Whatever request is being shared with you, that the Holy Spirit will come in a powerful way and move on that person, that situation, that relationship. Thank you, God. Lift up your needs to you and prayer requests to God.
with us. Thank you for listening to us. Because we know that you are not a silent God. You interact with us. You hear us. And you answer us. Thank you, God. In your name. Amen. I'd like you to turn into your Bibles to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, that is in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Keep going. Ruth, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Joel. Right before Jeremiah. All right. Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah is a very interesting man. He is a prophet. He is a prophet that lived around the eighth century BC. The first Isaiah lived around 740 B.C. I'm not going to get into the fact that there might be three different Isaiahs in in this world and uh, that uh, one of the reasons why they think there's at least two Isaiahs is right around chapter 40 of Isaiah, they refer to the destruction of the temple. They do refer to a destruction uh, of, of, of of the temple, and it didn't happen yet. And there's some situ- there's some events in Isaiah that if Isaiah was in 740, some of those situations did not ha- happen in his lifetime, but they happened afterwards. They think there are three uh, different Isaiahs <laughs> in the uh, in 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 the history of Israel, and they brought all of their works together to form the book of Isaiah. Uh, so just want to let you know that it, it, the the it just. The whole point of me telling you these things is not to get you all, wow. It's, uh, the, the, it's not to question the Bible, but to show you that everything in the Bible is not as neat and tidy as we think it is. <laughs> and when you get down to it and you study it and analyze it, you can see that, hey, some things are different. Which makes it, for me, more human, more godly, more intriguing for me. A prophet, Isaiah is a prophet around 740. He is prophesying to the nation of Israel. And he, God has a message and he goes to Isaiah and tells Isaiah this message that he is supposed to relay to Israel. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy is during the time of King Uzziah. And just right before the Babylonian, uh, Babylonian Empire took over, Israel, King Uzziah has just died, and you can read all about King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, very interesting story, became a, became a king around the age of 16 years old, uh, was a very good king, got a little prideful, started worshiping himself, thought hey, he was the center of the world, and all of a sudden he got leprosy and had to deal with leprosy for the rest of his life. Very intriguing story about King Uzziah. But right after, and it's kind of interesting because Uzziah's life would be a very good sermon to preach on, but not today. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe do that another day on how pride hurts us and will eat away at our lives. But that's another sermon for another day. Shortly after Uzziah's death, God, or Yahweh, went to Isaiah and told him that he had a message for Israel. And so the writings of Isaiah are the words of God that God wanted Israel to hear. So he goes to Isaiah and he says, this is what I want you to do. And this is what I want you to say because I am going to tell Israel what's going to happen to them. God was going to profoundly change not only Israel, but the world. Israel's history was about to be radically altered. True, it would take over 700 years for God's words to be seen and completed, but that's the way God works. He's God. I've been thinking about this whole concept of prayer over the last few months and reading about it and trying to understand it. See, God often works in one generation. And the outcome will be in another generation. Abraham, 
told Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. It was two generations, three generations later or more that Abraham became a great nation. Abraham did not see it himself. He had the promise. See, many of us get a promise from God, and we start praying about that. But because we carry a watch and our time is ticking away, we want God to work within that time. God, I need a job. So God, you, you expect God to provide you a job. God will provide you a job in his timing. And some things that we pray for may take a couple of generations to be seen. And we may never see it. It doesn't mean we stop praying for it. It doesn't mean that we stop looking for it and preparing for it. It's called the vision of God. I've been reading a book on the history of the Church of the Nazarene, and it's a very interesting book. And, and you, guys, you guys should all read it. But I, I, <laughs> history is so intriguing to me about all the different in, in, intrigues that occurred throughout the history of the Church of Nazarene. Many times people started praying for something in one generation and it didn't get it wasn't seen until two or three generations later. The whole idea what the church of Nazarene was always praying about was bringing entire sanctification to the people of, of, of God, to bring a holiness to them, to help them to understand and see that that there is a lifestyle of holiness that needs to be lived out. So God starts in the first, in Isaiah, in chapter 6, and calls Isaiah to do something great. But a lot of what Isaiah is talking about isn't going to be seen for 700 years, right around the time that Jesus comes, is born. Because, because Isaiah's message is prophesying the Messiah that will radically change Israel, and the whole world. We could talk about prayer and how our prayer life will affect generations to come, and that's why we need to continue to do it, but that's for another morning. We may have been called to praying for something now, a member of our family or a healing, but don't be surprised if you never see it. But don't ever stop praying for it. So God was tired of the way that his people, Israel, were living. He wanted to change things. And, it, and so he was going to, and when God changed things, he doesn't just do it uh, casually. He does it radically, profoundly. God always profoundly changes us. He doesn't make small little altercations to our life. He makes mammoth radical changes to our lives and the reason for it is to see how faithful we are to him. Through Isaiah's writings, over 700 years, God was going to explain this new thing that he was about to do and how it was going to radically, profoundly alter the way humanity did life. God was going to show the world his true nature. And up until now and up until Jesus, God begins now to show Israel through the prophets that he is not the big, bag, angry God who sits up there in heaven with the white flowing beard, with the lightning bolt, just waiting to see what's going to happen to every single one of us. And when something good happens to us, whoosh, uh, he, 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 he sends this tragedy upon us so that we are ripped apart because we're all so afraid of being Job. And when we get good things, we're afraid of those good things because God might steal them away to show how wonderful we are or our, our, our faith is in God. And I don't want to go through that pain. So what we do is we live through life with pain because we don't want to see the true nature of God. We don't understand the true nature of God. And when they say, fear the Lord your God Almighty, that comes from the Old Testament when they should have feared him because he did a lot of things out of anger 
anger towards sin, and there was a lot of sinning going on, and Jesus wasn't there, and the Holy Spirit wasn't, wasn't checking him. And when he came down, he would be like, what are you people doing? And because he wanted to wipe out sin, unfortunately, because we are sinful, we went along with him. And he said, okay, that's enough. I want to show you what my true nature is. So look, I have started this a few weeks ago. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what you've grown up on. We've got to get out of our mind the concept of the big, angry God dad who's going to take us out back and spank us for something that we've done. God's going to show us his nature. And he begins to show us his nature through Isaiah. And Isaiah begins to, Isaiah 6 is, is, is God's call of Isaiah to a new thing, a new change. And now through Isaiah, I am going to radically change the concept of who I am. And we're going to begin to do something different because you guys aren't getting it. And we got to do something different. My notes say Marcus, but JR is going to <laughs> JR is going to read Isaiah 6, 1 through 6. Isaiah 6, 1 through 6.